Welcome to the recorded version of Pets and Seniors, part of the Family Caregiver Support webinar series brought to you by the American Society in Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. On a personal note, before we get started, a couple years ago, unfortunately, our, our neighbor passed away and we inherited her older cat. And I was a very hesitant to take this cat in because he was pretty old. But it wound up being a wonderful experience and it was just really changed my perspective. So speaking about pets and seniors, if you or one of your loved ones is thinking about making an adoption of a new friend, I would really like to put a plug in for you to adopt an older cat or a senior animal or something along those lines because they really need a second chance and they really need a home. Bruce the cat was a wonderful companion to me. He was my little buddy. And so with that little PSA out of the way, We'll get started with our presentation today. Our presenter today is Lakeland Hogan. Lakeland is a gerontologist and caregiver advocate for home and set senior care. Lakeland works to educate professionals, families, and communities on issues older adults face. Lakeland is a doctoral candidate at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, where she is studying social gerontology. She has a Master of Arts in Social Gerontology and a Master's in Business Administration from UNO. Lakeland has professional experience in the private and public sectors of senior care services. She has worked on special projects for UNO's Department of Gerontology and the local area agency on aging. Lakeland serves as vice president of the board of directors for the Dreamweaver Foundation and is active in the Alzheimer's Association's Walk to End Alzheimer's. Lakeland has a passion for helping others, especially aging adults and their families. And with that, I would like to turn the floor and the presentation over to Lakeland. Welcome. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you for sharing your story about your neighbor's cat. I would second that PSA on adopting older animals. Uh, they do make great companions, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more in today's presentation. Uh, but hello, everyone. Happy New Year. I hope you all had a great holiday season and are settling into the first couple of weeks of 2020, a whole new decade. And I'm so excited that you're joining me for today's webinar on pets and seniors. But as Steve mentioned, this is part of a, an entire series, uh, the Caregiver Support Webinar Series. Uh, so if you're new to this webinar series, we, uh, our goal of the webinars is really to equip professionals in the aging space with information and resources on topics that impact family caregivers and older adults. And we have some really exciting topics on our 2020 calendar. So I would encourage you, uh, as Steve mentioned, to go out to the website and look at all of the great topics we have throughout the year and sign up for as many of those that interest you. Uh, but for today's topic, again, we're, we're focusing on our furry friends, our pets, uh, and how they can have a positive impact on the lives of older adults. Many older adults find that pets can provide companionship and love, uh, especially as they age, and they can help reduce feelings of isolation and loneliness. Uh, but we also know pet ownership isn't for everyone, so we're also going to talk about how older adults can still interact with pets without having to actually own a pet. There's certainly def uh, great ways to engage and you can still reap the benefits whether you're owning a pet or interacting with a pet. Uh, and then there's also some safety concerns, of course, uh, that we'll, we'll touch as well. So before we dive in, I thought I'd just briefly touch on our objectives for today's webinar. So it's my goal that by the end of today's webinar, you'll be able to uh, know more about the health impacts that pets can have on older adults, and also how they can impact isolation and loneliness. Uh, those are two huge topics uh, in the aging space right now, and, and pets certainly can uh, provide that companionship and hopefully help reduce those feelings of isolation and loneliness. Now we're going to talk about considerations for pet ownership. I mentioned earlier it's not for everyone and it's not a decision that you should take lightly. So there's some things that we should we should consider because pets, while they are great, they are a responsibility and there's certain things to consider. And then we'll, we'll talk about some pets that might be best for older adults or some tips on what to think about when looking uh, for the perfect pet. And then identify ways that older adults can interact with them uh, without having to actually own one of the pets that, that we'll be talking about. Uh, but we recently did a survey at Home Instead Senior Care on this topic because, you know, we're in the homes of older adults every single day, and, and we wanted to learn more about older adults and their perceptions of pets, their pet ownership. Uh, so this was a survey of North American pet owners over the age of 65. And in, at the top of this slide, you can see the various benefits of pet ownership that our uh, survey respondents um, 
told us about. So 82% um, viewed the company of a pet uh, as a huge benefit of pet ownership. Also, the comfort and unconditional love was high on the list of benefits. And pet ownership, they said, also provides entertainment and helps to improve their mood. Um, and growing up, we had a dog. Uh, and I, I remember every time we came home from school, she would come tearing through the house and, you know, be right there at the door to greet us and give us licks and kisses. And, you know, it's really hard not to be in a good mood when somebody is that excited to see you. So I can certainly see how um, that, that could be a benefit of pet ownership. And really the highest response we had um, when, we, when we were talking to older adults about pet ownership was 86% said life would be a lot lonelier and less happy without pets. So again, this kind of points back to that reducing feelings of isolation and loneliness, and we're going to talk even more about that later in the presentation. And then 58% said they wouldn't be as physically healthy without pets. And we certainly know that pet ownership can lead uh, an older adult to have a little bit more of an active life, depending on the pet. Um, so then some of the other survey findings that we found uh, were that, you know, home is where our pets are. 70% said that their pets are a deciding factor in where they're going to age. You know, they're that important to them that they're really considering their pets uh, in where they will age, how they will age. And 82% said they would not even consider moving to a senior living community if they could not bring their pet along. And we know that, you know, not all senior living communities allow pets. So, you know, that's a big part of the decision-making process, and, and we know that sometimes those moves have to take place, um, but those are times where discussions about what will happen to the pet, can the pet come along, maybe there's some alternative uh, to pet ownership uh, that can be uh, introduced at that time. Um, so again, it's just a, a very important factor when uh, considering where an older adult will live. And then for those that don't own pets, they still can reap the benefits. So we, talk, we asked older adults without pets how they still get their pet interaction. Over half of them said uh, they usually visit a pet at a family member's home. Um, others say I go to a friend or neighbor's home. Um, and 26% said that they even get visitors from pets in their own home. Maybe it's pet therapy, having friends or family bring over their pets to visit. And then about 15% said, you know, they get outside to a park and they interact with pets uh, at a park or on their walk, that sort of thing. We had a few more pieces of interesting results that I thought I would share, share with you. Um, we looked at those over 65 that lived alone versus those who lived with others. And you can see the results in the pink box. Uh, the statistics on the left are those who live alone. The statistics on the right are those who live with others. So you can see, if you're looking at all of those numbers, really those who are living alone almost place higher benefit on pet ownership. So 83% of those that are living alone find the benefits of unconditional love compared to 73% who are living with others. Um, and then the feeling of making me feel loved, very similar to that unconditional love, but those uh, that are living alone, 75% of them say, yes, my pet makes me feel loved, compared to 59% of those who are living with others. And then when we think about pet ownership, I mentioned earlier, it is a responsibility. So it does give a person a sense of purpose. They have to get up, let the dog out, or feed the cat, or feed the goldfish. Um, and so 63% of those living alone said that, yes, my pet gives me a sense of purpose, versus 42% of those living with others. And then oftentimes I even find myself talking to animals, uh, and, and so we we found that 61% of those living alone says, you know, my pet gives me someone to talk to. And that's compared to 42% of those living with others. So again, you can see those numbers show that, especially for those older adults who are living alone, uh, there is a huge benefit to pet ownership. And then when it comes to the types of pets uh, that older adults are owning, uh, just some fun facts are at the bottom. Uh, dogs rule, according to, uh, to the numbers. Please, please don't think of me any differently if you're a cat person. Uh, but 62% uh, of our survey respondents had dogs, 55% had a cat, uh, and then only 9% had a bird or a fish, 
2% had small mammals such as a gerbil, and 1% owned a lizard, turtle, or other reptiles. So there are other pets outside of cats and dogs uh, that older adults are owning, but really the dogs and the cats are uh, taking the lead in, in, those, in the animal category. Uh, but we've been talking about, you know, the positive benefits. And when we look at specifically the health benefits, there has been a lot of research done over the years, um, and studies have shown that there is, in fact, positive health impacts of pet ownership or pet interaction. It's been found that there is a strong attachment. Um, those with strong attachment to pet ownership have reported less depression in an older adult population. Uh, in one trial, uh, our research study of 68 nursing home residents uh, down in Australia, uh, there was um, a dog that visited uh, the nursing home residents, and the residents then reported less depression, and they also reported less fatigue, tension, and confusion. Uh, so again, some great positive health impacts there. We also know that exercise can accompany uh, pet ownership, depending on the pet type of pet that you have. Uh, and also, animal-assisted therapy has been used uh, among the older adult population. And, and that kind of interaction can really help improve heart health and can help lower blood pressure. And then when we think about our stress levels, um, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been super stressed and you come upon a fluffy dog or, or kitten and you just kind of run your hands through, it really does kind of give you a calming presence. So uh, it, in, in the research, the presence of a companion animal has uh, shown benefits not only uh, for older adults in terms of their psychological stress, but also family caregivers. So when we think about pet ownership and older adults, not only is it impacting uh, them, but it also can be a positive impact on their family caregivers. And it can also um, kind of buffer acute stress situations, and it can also diminish the perception of stress, uh, which I think is some really interesting findings. So um, positive impacts there. Pet ownership, pet interaction can be good for a person's stress levels. Then when we look specifically at those living with Alzheimer's or other types of dementias, there's been quite a bit of research done here too. And pet therapy has been found to decrease agitation uh, in this population. It can also help increase their social interactions. And then in one study, this is a study done at Peru, Purdue University, pardon me, uh, it revealed that people living with Alzheimer's in a skilled care facility uh, that had fish tanks appeared to be more relaxed and alert, and they also ate up to 21% more food than they did before the introduction of the fish tanks. So I thought that was very interesting. I mean, uh, we talk a lot about uh, companionship at mealtime and, and how important that can be for an older adult, but um, I guess I hadn't even stopped to think about pet companionship at mealtime, and, and perhaps that can increase the food intake, the nutritional intake for an older adult. So some really interesting findings there, uh, but I would argue that the biggest impact uh, that pets can have is, is on the reduction of isolation and loneliness. And I shared, you know, towards the beginning, uh, the couple first slides, uh, that our survey respondents did say, yes, pet ownership helps me feel less isolated, less lonely. Um, and I've done an entire presentation on isolation and loneliness, and again, it's a huge topic. Uh, and these terms are often used together, but they have slightly different meanings. So isolation is an objective term when a person does not have enough people to interact with. And then loneliness is subjective, which is distress over not having enough social relationships or not enough contact with people. So somebody could be surrounded by a lot of people, perhaps in a, a senior living facility, or they might live in a household with, uh, with other family members, they still might feel lonely, uh, versus somebody who is isolated. They might be living alone. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're lonely. Perhaps they have that pet companion, and, and that really helps reduce those feelings of loneliness. Uh, but uh, again, those two terms that 
are sometimes used interchangeably, but they do have a little bit of a different meaning. But regardless, um, pets really can re help reduce the feelings of isolation and loneliness. Uh, they provide great companionship. Uh, they can also increase socialization with others. Um, I think about this in my own life. If I go out on a walk by myself, uh, I hardly interact with anyone. Usually I put my earbuds in and I'm listening to a podcast or some music, but if I uh, take the dog out for a walk, I find myself interacting with other people. They'll stop and ask to pet the dog or uh, ask what the dog's name is, uh, or they're just a little more friendly because I have a dog with me, which is kind of fascinating. So if you think about it, these pets can also increase socialization. If you've ever been in a senior uh, living facility where there's been a therapy dog brought in, um, you just see people kind of flock to the dog uh, and pet the dog, and, and they start kind of reminiscing about their childhood dog. So it really, again, can increase that social interaction uh, with others. Um, so it's kind of a unique, unique benefit there. And as I mentioned earlier, it can help pet ownership or pet interaction can help uh, be a buffer for stress and diminish a person's perception of stress. So again, I, I probably credit it to, you know, uh, getting your hands on their fur or uh, if it's a fish, you know, watching the fish or the birds interact, uh, it really can have that calming effect. Uh, and in this, on this slide is a picture of Mary and her cat, Crystal. Uh, in a little bit, I'll share. We recently, along with that survey, uh, put out a website with a bunch of resources, petsandseniors.com, and I'll share that web address again in a little bit. But on that site, we have some great stories of pets uh, and older adults and their interactions. And, and so we're, we have a video of, of Mary talking about her cat, Crystal. Uh, but she says that, you know, she has such a great sense of companionship because Crystal is with her in the home. Uh, she knows that Crystal's there to keep her company. She even you know, looks out for her. If she's been laying in bed in the morning for too long, Crystal kind of gets her up and moving, uh, really gives her a reason to get out of bed in the morning, provides her great love and comfort. And uh, her caregiver also says in the video that it's comforting to her that, you know, when she's not there, she knows that Mary has Crystal to talk to and interact with. So uh, I just love hearing stories of, of people and their pets. Um, and, and so I hope you will go out to that website Again, I'll share it in a little bit uh, to learn about more pet stories, Mary and Crystal and others. Uh, but I mentioned uh, kind of towards the start of the presentation that there are some considerations for pet ownership. We know that pet ownership is not for everyone, not a decision to be taken lightly. Uh, and so I have some kind of 10 considerations here uh, for older adults and their families to consider, their family caregivers to consider uh, when looking into pet ownership. Um, the first is uh, that there are a lot of products and services and technology now in this pet space. I don't remember growing up having so many pet stores uh, and pet aisles in the Targets and the Walmarts of the world, but there are so many great products out there that can really make pet ownership easier. So uh, when you're starting to consider pet ownership, research these products and services available. Things like lightweight, flushable cat litters, uh, remote treat dispensers, activity trackers for pets. There's a lot of services like dog walking services. Even some Meals on Wheels programs now also have an option for providing pet food. Um, so there's um, lots, of, lots of options out there. Even uh, some pet stores offer uh, fish tank cleaning services uh, to help people maintain their aquariums. So again, just do a little bit of research. It'll help you help you in determining you know, what's available in the community to help with pet ownership. And then the next is to learn about the breed or species that you're looking to adopt uh, or looking to bring into your home. So, uh, you know, of course, uh, the type of breed is likely to impact the type of personality, uh, the energy levels, um, and if you're adopting from an agency or a former pet owner, you'll want to ask some questions. You know, how active is the animal? Is it trained? If it's a dog, does it bark? Uh, how does the animal interact with strangers? And what is the life expectancy uh, of, of the animal? We know some birds can live up to 60 years old. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about bringing a bird into the home, that might be some, some factors to consider. 
and then go in with your eyes wide open. Uh, it can be really easy to get caught up in the cuteness of a puppy, a cat, a kitten, or a bird, uh, but it's it's really important to ask realistic questions. You know, what are the daily week and weekly routines of the animal? Uh, does the pet, <clears throat> pardon me, need to be taken in for grooming? Uh, what are the care needs at home? What's the veterinary care that's needed, dependent on the pet? What kind of gear, uh, you know, cages, uh, all that kind of stuff. What is what is the feeding cost? You know, a, a large dog is going to eat a lot more dog food than a smaller dog. So again, uh, those are things that we don't always consider when we're caught up in how cute the animal is, but really important things to consider. Also consider the health of the family. Uh, if an older adult is living with others, you want to make sure that uh, everyone in the home uh, can handle the pet requirements. Um, and, you know, allergies are common for especially dogs and cats. So those who are visiting the home regularly, uh, you might want to consider them as well when you're adopting a pet or bringing them into the home. And then you want to ensure that you can be a good neighbor and friend. Uh, so uh, if you have, if you live in a neighborhood with dogs that bark a lot, uh, sometimes it can be um, a little stressful. So consider that. Uh, also, um, you know, will your dog or cat or pet interact with with the next door neighbor's animals, or are there children or family members that come to the home frequently that could be frightened by the pet? Uh, so really just thinking about the impact that the pet could have on others um, is important to consider. There's a few more considerations here. Factoring in tra pet training um, is important as well. Uh, it can be a benefit to uh, adopt an older dog if it's already trained. Um, but there are also a lot of great training programs out there. And this is really important, especially for an older adult that might have some mobility limitations, uh, to make sure that the pet uh, knows not to pull on the leash or um, hopefully can help avoid some of those fall issues. And then if you, um, if you cannot take your pet with you, if you travel a lot, if you're still active in, in that way, you'll want to make sure you can plan for who will take care of your pet when you're gone. Um, there's a lot of boarding services out there, a lot of pet sitters available in communities, but again, something else to consider. And then um, a lot of times uh, we at home instead, when we go into care for an older adult, we also uh, help with their pets. So, you know, do you need extra assistance at home? And if it's not a professional service, maybe it's a, a granddaughter, grandson that can come over and help. Uh, or if you are having to make that move from a home setting to a community setting, uh, consider uh, does that place allow pets um, or do you need to find uh, a different home for the pet? So that kind of uh, takes us into that next one of looking into the future. Um, consider, you know, um, how long the pet will be around. I, I know it's kind of not the most fun thing to talk about, but uh, make a plan for who might adopt the animal uh, once the individual has passed on or if they have to move on to a different facility uh, setting or into a facility or community setting. Uh, just make sure that there is a plan in place. Um, even estate plans, uh, you can include your pets in that type of more official planning on, on who's going to take your pet once you're you're no longer able to. And then are you willing to be responsible for the pet is really at the at the end of the day, um, that is a big question that needs to be answered. Um, ask yourself, are you, are you ready for the responsibility of caring for pets? They are a big commitment, uh, and again, one that shouldn't be taken lightly, uh, but they can be such a benefit um, to, to older adults and, and people of all ages. I wanted to share a, a quick story of my grandparents. So these are my grandparents, Jan and Larry. They have been lifelong pet owners. Ever since I was little, uh, there have been pets in their home, a lot of times multiple pets. Uh, and they had a dog called Apollo, and he was kind of a lab chow mix. He was a nice-sized dog. And about, I would say, 10 years ago, he passed away, and he and my grandpa were so close. They would go on walks every day, and uh, and I could tell after his 
passing, Apollo's passing, that my grandparents were, were not quite themselves. They found themselves without a single pet in the home. And, you know, they've had pets in the home, like I said, their, my whole life that I've, I've been around. Um, and so I could tell that, you know, they were maybe getting a little depressed and lonely. And a family friend of ours had a litter of puppies. And my grandma, oh, she just loves puppies. And so they decided, all right, they're ready for another dog uh, and, and got this puppy. However, uh, the family probably should have helped in doing a little more research. This dog was a lab Australian Shepherd mix. It was very rambunctious and hyper. And while it was so adorable, it really was becoming a little bit of a hazard in the home. Uh, and we told my grandma finally and grandpa, you know, it's okay to give this dog up for adoption. And it really broke their heart to have to give up on this sweet little puppy. But, um, you know, they came to the realization that, you know, at this point in their lives, uh, perhaps adopting an older dog is a better fit for them. So they uh, put the dog up for adoption. It got adopted to a great home. And then they found the two dogs that you see here on the screen. Uh, both of them, Punkin on the left, Rosie on the right, uh, are were more mature dogs. They were a couple years old. They had been well trained, um, and and really both of them have become just great companions. It helps uh, them stay physically active. It brightens their day. Uh, the two dogs play together, and I've never heard so much joy and laughter uh, in their house uh, as I as I do now with these two pups. So uh, it just it's just a story to kind of uh, in, uh, illustrate the importance of finding the right fit uh, and. You know, an older adult might, again, gravitate towards that cute puppy, but finding that uh, perfect fit in terms uh, of the size of the animal and energy levels can really make a big difference in the quality of life for the pet and for the older adult. I know that the, the puppy is, I probably has a, a great family with little kids that they that puppy can run and run uh, where it's, it's kind of a better fit for the pup. And now my grandparents have these two cute dogs to keep them company. Um, but some some tips on finding the best pet type for an older adult um, are here on the screen. So the small the smaller may be better. Um, smaller animals, especially when it comes to those dog breeds, may be a better fit. Um, other uh, small uh, small dogs. Um, could be, you know, a Shih Tzu, Poodle, Maltese, Miniature Schnauzer. Other good small animals could be, you know, a turtle, a hamster, gerbil, fish, birds, uh, kind of thinking outside the box. Um, and then often an older animal is a calmer animal. Uh, so while a smaller animal could be a good fit, uh, an older animal could be a good fit as well, as I kind of just talked about. And then uh, if you look at the ease of care, uh, pets, uh, again, are, that, are a commitment. Um, and so some animals require less care than others. You know, a freshwater fish, for instance, can be a good alternative to older adults who uh, want a pet but want one that doesn't require a lot of care and attention. And then independence can be a plus. Uh, animals uh, can require a lot of attention, but some some do not need as much. So cats kind of hit that sweet spot for a lot of people where they don't need to go outside. They don't need a large amount of care, really just a litter box, food and water. Uh, they do need to be played with, however, but a lot of times you can do that by, you know, sitting on the couch or lying down. And a lot of cats like to cuddle as well. So it can be a nice option. So consider the independence of the pet. And then back to that longevity uh, point one more time. Uh, you, uh, you might not think about, you know, the age of the animal or how long they might live, uh, but that is a, an important thing to consider. You know, I mentioned earlier uh, a parrot can live up to 60 years old, uh, and, you know, animals such as gerbils might live two to five years, uh, while rabbits uh, can live to 10 to 15 years. So, again, a a little bit of research uh, into longevity uh, is so important. And I, I've been talking a lot about cats and dogs, but uh, there are some surprising pet companions out there uh, for older adults that are worth considering. Um, they might not be for everyone, but, um, you know, a turtle can be uh, a great companion that lives in an aquarium. Um, 
a guinea pig. They are resilient. They're generally easy to care for. They can be very entertaining. A hamster, also very low maintenance uh, and can be an affordable purchase. Um, and they come in a lot of shapes and sizes and uh, often don't take up a lot of space. And again, can be really visually entertaining. And then fish uh, are a great option. Uh, and they, don't also, they also don't take up a lot of space and ha require just minimal maintenance, depending on the type of fish. Uh, and then birds. Uh, small bird species such as canaries and finches uh, might be a really good option, especially for someone living in an apartment or uh, in a senior living community. Uh, again, a parrot might be a little more fun. It can talk back to you, but that longevity um, factor might be important to consider there. And then I know a bearded dragon lizard is probably the last thing you would consider getting an older adult. Uh, but um, the bearded dragons are really kind of an exception um, because they're, they're very friendly, easygoing, uh, very docile animals that can really well adapt to humans. So if you have an older adult that you're working with uh, that really has an affection for reptiles, a bearded dragon lizard might be one to consider. And then rabbits, uh, they're very intelligent social and affectionate animals and often really bond closely with their owners. And I know at one point when I was younger, my grandma and grandpa did have a rabbit or two. And I remember uh, finding a lot of joy in playing with their rabbit as a kid. But we've been talking about how pet ownership is great, but it isn't always for everyone. So um, it's really important to think through uh, pet companionship. It might be tempting, again, but might not be for everyone. Uh, more than half of the pet owners that we surveyed um, in our Home and Stead survey uh, who once had a pet said they really didn't want that responsibility again. So it might not be that they're not a pet person. It might just be that they don't want to take on that responsibility. And it also might be unsafe for some older adults to own a pet, possibly due to mobility li limitations, cognitive impairment, or simply their living environment is really not conducive to pet ownership. Uh, but that, again, doesn't mean uh, that these people can't interact with pets. Um, really, uh, many would be, would be happy with uh, regular interaction with pets, even if they cannot own their own pets. Um, and really, uh, to kind of reiterate the safety concerns uh, that come along with pet ownership, it, it is important to talk those through. Um, while, while our furry friends can make great companions, they can also cause some safety issues. Uh, more than 21,000 older Americans are treated in emergency rooms each year due to falls associated with their pets, uh, dogs or cats. And this, that's uh, a statistic from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And while that's not a huge number, uh, it is a significant number. And uh, the highest rate of those falls occur in older adults over the age of 75. So um, when, when they are falling, um, also the most common diagnosis is a fracture of some sort. And we know for older adults that fractures, especially a hip fracture, can result in some serious health consequences, uh, such as uh, functional impairments, uh, possible nursing home admission, uh, and could really um, unfortunately also increase uh, mortality rates. So we know that while um, having a pet is, is a great thing, we ne really need to be sure that uh, we're considering safety. So when we think about safety, tripping hazards, that's probably the first thing that come to mind when you think about pet ownership. And, and consider things like the animal lurking around the feet or pet toys left around the house. Um, you know, one thing to consider, I know, um, at least for me, I seem to almost trip over the dog the most when I'm cooking in the kitchen because they want to be right there to get all the scraps of food on the floor or um, uh, they just want to be in the center of action. So consider talking with the older adult about, um, you know, maybe while you're cooking in the kitchen or times uh, where you're in the bathroom, a small space, uh, perhaps you put the dog in the bedroom while you're you're doing your cooking. And then as you're eating, let them out and they can sit there and while you're sitting at the table, they can be there with you, but it can help minimize those, those opportunities for trips and falls as you're maneuvering the kitchen or maneuver, 
maneuvering the bathroom. So just kind of getting creative. It's not um, saying, oh, this dog is a trip hazard. We have to get them out of the home right away. It's really kind of thinking through um, opportunities to just minimize the risks there. An untrained dog, especially one that jumps up, can be a safety concern. I'll never forget my brother got a puppy. Uh, she's a, a big puppy. Um, and when my grandma came over, the dog jumped up on her, and we all saw her take a step back. Um, and we, you know, it, it really didn't even cross our mind that, that she would, would hump, jump up on her. Um, but again, she was just trying to be friendly, and luckily we were able to help you know, stabilized grandma. She didn't have a fall, but we now know anytime uh, that the dog is there and grandma's there, we need to make sure that someone's holding on to the dog's collar um, so that the dog doesn't hop up on grandma. And then also for those who have multiple dogs, tangled leashes um, can pose a safety concern. Um, if you've ever tried to walk two dogs at once, I, I marvel at the dog walkers in you know, New York City or Chicago where they're walking five or six dogs all at the same time. Um, it, it can be a challenge. So um, again, safety concerns to consider there. Perhaps uh, there's a special leash that um, is available uh, to minimize opportunities to get tangled up in the leash. And then, uh, of course, those mo mobility limitations could pose a safety concern, could increase the risk of a fall, or limit uh, the uh, amount of, of care that the individual can provide to, to the dog, cat, or other pet. And then cognitive issues. Uh, this might lead to uh, someone has cognitive impairment, it might lead to things such as neglect of the animal or overfeeding of the animal. Um, so again, things to consider. Uh, but it's important, again, to talk about ways to reduce the risk. I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, thinking about uh, limiting the pet to a certain area of the home uh, during uh, times of the day or at all times, uh, discussing um, op options for, you know, dog walking, um, you know, reducing the risk of, of the pet pulling uh, on, on the leash by uh, possibly taking that pet to training of some sort, obedience training. Um, and this obedience training can really help to um, minimize the amount that the the animals pulling on the leash, uh, but also talking with the older adult about, about those risks. And then outsourcing help when needed, uh, asking a family member, friend, or neighbor to help out uh, a pet care service or uh, hiring a professional caregiver uh, to help out with that as well is always an option. So we know that, um, you know, of course, the safety is uh, important, but if you determine that, you know, owning a dog uh, isn't probably the best fit for the older adult, there are certainly great alternatives to pet ownership. Um, so first, you could get to know your neighbor's pets. Uh, if you regularly walk through the neighborhood, uh, you might get to know certain dogs uh, or um, if, if you have a neighbor who regularly walks their pet, maybe you ask to accompany them on their walk. Um, and it'll be a, a double bonus. You'll get to know your neighbor better and also get to interact with the pets. You could also connect with a pet therapy animal. Uh, if the individual is living in a care community, they might have that available. Um, or uh, there are a lot of pet therapy type groups uh, or hospitals are often uh, places where people go with their pet uh, therapy dog or cat. So you might be able to reach out to the local hospital's volunteer department and say, hey, do you have any pet therapy dogs? And then perhaps you could arrange time to visit the hospital when that dog is there or um, arrange a, a different a time to interact with that pet. The, the dog that's pictured here on the, on the slide is also one of those pet stories on the website that I'll mention in a little bit, but this is Cal, and he actually is a pet therapy dog at one of our Home Instead franchise offices, and he goes out and visits clients, um, and he's really become part of the Home Instead family. Um, people are, the clients really love him. They, uh, he will jump up on the couch next to them and, and snuggle right in, and they'll pet him, and it just brings so much joy. Uh, so Cal is well-loved, um, a well-loved therapy dog. And then if you haven't heard of these robotic companion pets, uh, they are really neat. I see them a lot at, at trade shows, um, and I've actually 
been able to uh, see older adults interacting with them, and it, it really is remarkable, especially in those uh, for those living with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. Um, it really can be uh, therapeutic to interact. Uh, so there's a great one at the puppy called Tombot. There is a seal uh, called Paro um, that's out there and available. And then Hasbro has both a dog and a cat. Uh, and it's amazing how these, these robotic companions react uh, when you touch them and uh, they can, uh, with I don't know all the technology behind them, but there's, uh, they, they interact with those who are in front of them. It, it really is a neat experience. Um, so that could be an alternative. And then visiting a pet store. Uh, some pet stores sell um, all of the types of animals that we've, or most pet stores sell all the types of animals that we've been talking about. Uh, so you can get your pet fix even just by visiting. And a lot of times they'll let you touch them and play with them, so it might be a nice alternative. Um, also, in several communities across the United States, dog and cat cafes are becoming more popular. Uh, so you can go to this uh, cafe and have a cup of coffee and pet a cat. Uh, so you might look into whether or not that is available uh, in the community that the older adult is in. Uh, you could also hang out at a dog park. It might sound strange, but you don't have to own a dog to go to a dog park. So you could uh, you know, sit on the bench and socialize with other people who have furry friends uh, and, again, reap the benefit of pet interaction in that way. You can also foster pets until they're adopted. So it's a little bit of pet ownership, but not the full commitment. Um, so you can get your kind of temporary animal fix by uh, re uh, working with a rescue organization that might have short-term adoption options. And then you can volunteer at a rescue organization. Um, there, are, You can do that through animal shelters, zoos, um, a lot of opportunities there for volunteering. So um, I just, again, want to make the point uh, that pet ownership, of course, is great for older adults, but it can benefit family caregivers as well. Uh, so they can certainly reap the benefits of, of pet ownership in their loved one loved one's life, but they too can also uh, interact with that pet uh, while they are visiting their loved one. We know that people's pets really do become part of the family. Uh, and so, um, you know, family caregivers uh, can reap the benefits of that, but also important for family caregivers to consider um, that, you know, any discussion around pet ownership might come with a lot of emotions and, and sensitivity because, uh, you know, those pets do become like just another member of the family. And so um, just just really important for, for caregivers to consider. So uh, I'm going to just share some resources here towards the end. I promised you I would uh, share with you that Pets and Seniors resource, uh, petsandseniors.com. On this site, there's so many great resources. A lot of the tips that I've gone through, they're, they're out on the website. Uh, but there's also a quiz that can help you determine your, who's your perfect pet pal. So it uh, has a lot of questions about your lifestyle and your personality. It's just 10 short questions that you can take online, and it, it kind of gives you a recommendation on a type of pet to consider. Um, and then there's also those great uh, pet stories out there uh, that have some videos that go along with it. And Actually, the woman on the screen, her name is Beth, um, and she is a volunteer. So that was one of the options. You don't have to own a pet. You can go volunteer. She walks dogs. And I love in her story, she says, um, you know, there's three silent killers of older adults, the three R's, the remote, the recliner, and the refrigerator. And she says that, you know, vol volunteering with animals gets her out of the house, gets her away from the refrigerator, out of the recliner, uh, and really helps her to maintain an active lifestyle, helps to keep her healthy. I know she also volunteers at the zoo. Um, in her local community. So um, again, some just great resources and insight on the petsandseniors.com website. And all the survey information that I shared at the beginning of the presentation is also on there. And then here are some additional uh, resources. Uh, petpartners.org is a great resource. Um, I 
recently learned about the Human Animal Bond Research Institute. Uh, that's a great organization that does a lot of that research behind what are the benefits of pet ownership, the health impacts, the impact on isolation and loneliness, not only for older adults, but people across the lifespan. Uh, but it's a, a great organization. Uh, and then if you're looking for help with that, that perfect pet match, you can go to petfinder.com. Uh, and then it's, uh, a lot of communities have a local humane society, uh, and so you can visit their website for more information. And then uh, if you want some extra help in the home to help take care of the pets, uh, of course, you can visit homeinstead.com. And then for any additional uh, caregiving stress-related uh, topics, our caregiverstress.com website is great. Uh, and then for those who have a loved one with Alzheimer's and dementia, help for alzheimersfamilies.com. So um, I hope that these resources uh, can help you as you uh, talk with the older adults that you work with, the family caregivers you work with about pet ownership. Uh, again, it can be uh, you know, such a benefit, uh, but even pet interaction uh, can also have benefits too if an older adult uh, cannot own a pet themselves. Um, but uh, I encourage you to, to reach out and learn more at, at these various websites. And now, Steve, I will open it up to you. I love this picture. I had to throw it in there somewhere. So I thought I'd, I'd leave that up for you all to enjoy while we uh, answer some questions. So, Steve, any questions for me? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Lakeland. Wonderful presentation on a very important topic. And uh, yeah, everyone, it is time for the Q&A. So if you want to send in your questions, please do so right now using the questions box you can see there on the screen. And uh, let's jump right into it here. Lakeland, the first question for you, what are the concerns for a senior to take care of a pet and how can they be addressed? Yeah, th that's a great question. I know we, we kind of went over some of those concerns. Um, if you think about all the things that a pet needs, that's kind of uh, probably a good way to start thinking about um, some concerns. So, um, you know, pets, all of them need to be fed. Uh, so, you know, does the older adult have all the resources to make sure that that animal can be fed as often as it needs to? So uh, that's everything from, you know, can they get out to the store uh, to purchase food or is there a service that, that delivers, could deliver food to the home? A lot of grocery stores can deliver groceries, can deliver pet food. Do they have the financial resources um, to maintain uh, the upkeep of the pet, to feed the pet, that sort of thing? Um, and also a lot of pets um, have... Um, physical needs, we can categorize it as that. So, you know, a dog needs to be walked a lot of times. Um, cats seem to be, <clears throat> pardon me, um, they don't necessarily need to be walked, but they need to be interacted with and played with. Uh, but when you think about the physical needs also, um, you know, how often do they have to go to the vet? Uh, what kind of um, um, things have to be done on a regular basis? Is it, is it trimming of nails? Is it uh, vaccinations? Is it um, uh, regular grooming? Uh, so those are things to consider as well. Uh, and then when we think about, you know, older adults, uh, I, back to the, the issue of mobility, um, you know, does the older adult, um, are they mobile enough to be able to provide for all the needs of the pet? If not, um, are there people or services that can help with that? So, you know, even if an older adult has mobility issues, um, is there a dog walking service that is available? Or is there a family member, friend, neighbor who can, can help with that? Um, but when you think of mobility, we also think about that, that tripping hazard that I've, I've talked about throughout the presentation. Uh, and so uh, talking through, you know, what are the options there? Uh, if, if it's an option to keep that animal in a specific area of the house um, or train the animal uh, to not be right underfoot, um, uh, that might be an option. But if, if it's not possible, then that's when some alternative options might need to be discussed. Um, and then issues of, of cognitive impairment might be um, an area of concern. So uh, if an older adult is starting to show, or an individual is starting to show uh, signs of cognitive impairment, one of the signs me might be uh, that they uh, are forgetting to feed the animal or are overfeeding. They 
they didn't remember that they already fed them once that day. And, and so uh, that can be hazardous to the animal's health. Um, or, um, and so in those, in those scenarios, you might be able to, again, uh, find services or options to help that older adult uh, maintain that animal in the home. Uh, but it might, again, be uh, an area of concern uh, that an alternate alternate options might need to be discussed. So um, those are kind of a, a good start to, to some areas of concern that you might want to consider. Um, but um, hopefully you can find solutions uh, that work for everyone involved. Uh, and if not, then um, if, if the pet has to be removed from the home, uh, I would encourage family caregivers and those working with the older adult to find alternative ways for that individual to still interact with pets because most likely uh, they have the pet in the home because it's, pets are important to them and, uh, and they uh, enjoy having that companionship. And so um, want to make sure that if, if that is removed, that it's replaced uh, with, with something or I don't know if you could ever truly replace the pet, but substituted with, with something that still gives them that, that sense of um, companionship and, and um, connectedness. So great question. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question for you here, Lakeland. Can you address the importance of prearranging care for pets when the older owner can no longer care for them, making care plans for the pets that are left behind after their owner's entry into hospice or a death, including pets in their trust and wills, et cetera? Yeah, that is a really great point. Um, yeah, making sure that there is a plan in place for the pet is really, really important. And I think it's also important for families to have an honest conversation about that and and for the family caregivers to really also assess, um, do I want to take this pet into my life. Uh, you might say to your loved one, oh, if something happens to you, yes, I'll take the dog, or yes, I'll take the cat. But but when that happens, um, you might stop and think, wow, I really didn't think all of this through. So, so it is really important um, to um, to have those conversations. And, and um, absolutely right, even working them into a will, um, that sort of thing. Um, so very important to consider um, and, and to have a plan and to research the options. Uh, what are the options for um, adoption in your community? Is there a humane society um, or um, you know, is there someone, someone else outside the family? A lot of times, I'll even see people posting on on Facebook or uh, on various social medias that you know they have a cat looking for a home, a loving home. So you can maybe even get a little bit creative there. But I want to make sure that um, that that animal is being passed on to a family uh, who will love it, or an owner that will will love it and have the capacity in their own lives to take on uh, the animal. So. Um, very, it's very important um, to have those discussions uh, and to consider those things when um, it, the animal is is being brought into the older adult's life in the first place. So, great question. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here, Lakeland. I used to work at an LTC facility and tried hard to get pets to visit. It was quite difficult with clearance. We finally got a few service dogs and smaller guinea pigs and rabbits in. The residents were so happy. Are any of these organizations are there any organizations that can help with getting animal visits at facilities? That is that is a great question, and I think that that's so wonderful. First of all, um, that you were able to bring in uh, animals, even if they were just smaller ones. I think that that those smaller pets they're underestimated. Um, but I would um, I would encourage you to go to to the Pet Partners website. Um, I, I believe that you can learn, you can learn about um, animals in your community, but, but I would certainly um, reach out to your, your local humane society um, to see if they are aware of any pet therapy uh, animals. If you're listening uh, on this webinar and, and you have an idea, feel free to comment it in as well. Um, but there are a lot of pet, um, pet therapists uh, that um, 
are available in the community uh, that you just might not be aware of. So uh, I would check um, even you know, at your local pet store, uh, pop in and see if, if they're aware of any pet therapy uh, options. And hospitals somehow are always in the know, it seems. Their volunteer coordinators are always in the know of, of pet therapists in the area. So, um, I mean, if you even do a quick Google search in your area of pet therapy, um, there's likely to be quite a bit uh, quite a few options that come up depending on if you're in a more urban or rural scenario. Um, but there are, there are some great uh, pet therapy options out there. Um, and, you know, sometimes uh, I've been working with senior living communities over the years, sometimes the employees will put their dog or uh, pet through a pet therapy type of, of class um, so that they can bring their animal in and interact as well. So, um, you know, that is a great question. And, and I think um, if you haven't heard of Dr. Bill Thomas's greenhouse theory, um, it's a really interesting um, concept of, of kind of bringing pets and the outdoors in. I think in one of his senior living communities, he even brought a horse uh, in to the facility and it really, the, the uh, residents really just lit up to see a live horse. I mean, I think I would light up too if I saw a live horse walk into any building um, when they weren't expected to. But um, that's another, just if you're looking for more kind of research and background on, on bringing animals and plants and kind of the outdoors in um, to a senior living community, the uh, I think it's called the Greenhouse Theory by Dr. Bill Thomas. Um, it's, it's a, he has a great body of research out there. But great question. Okay, and yes, we did have some people who wrote in about this great. topic with some suggestions. So um, first one, in Maryland, Pets on Wheels is a great organization. Perhaps they have other uh, franchises or chains other place, places. Uh, the zoo brought in some people trained with smaller animals, snakes, rabbits, and a, a baby wallaby. Um, there are also a lot of local resources that have therapy dogs that you can ask at a vet office if they have a list of local resources. So just a couple quick uh, pieces of information on where you might be able to get some animals in your locality to bring into a facility. I love, um, I love the suggestion of the zoo, Steve. I know in one of our local facilities, um, uh, a lady on hospice wanted to see a penguin. Uh, she had never seen a penguin in her life, and the zoo brought a penguin to the senior living community. Uh, and I was, somebody was telling me this, and they said, you've never seen so many people come out of their rooms to see this penguin waddling down the hallway. So you never know until you ask. Maybe your local zoo can, can come out and bring animals, and, and maybe even a penguin. I thought that was neat. Yes, that's great. I'd, I'd like to see a baby wallaby up close myself. Um, Absolutely. Okay, time for another quick question here for you. Do you have do you have any resources to assist the older adults with continue to paying for vet care needs of their pets? More in terms such as resources available across the nation, not necessarily in your community, uh, a special group. Do you have any any thoughts on that? That is a really good question. Um, I. I have not come across much information uh, on that. Um, I I know that what's becoming a trend in in workplaces is offering you know kind of a pet insurance, and I'm not sure um, how widely available that is to those who may not be working. Um, but that is becoming a benefit that is be is becoming more and more popular. Um, I know that a lot of times. Um, you know, there might be financial aid, aid available out there if you contact your local Humane Society. Um, that is a pretty nationwide uh, uh, type of, uh, of the society. Humane Society has a lot of locations, um, but um, a lot of times they are in the know of um, of opportunities for financial assistance or uh, low cost options. Um, so I wish I, I wish I could offer up more suggestions on that, but I would that's what I think would be a good place to start um, is, is to check in with the local humane society um, to see what options might exist in your local community. All right. 
Well, Lakeland, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our hour here, and it's time for us to wrap up today. But I want to thank you for joining us today for this really great presentation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.